I'd like to introduce our speaker, John Rickford. Um, John was born in Georgetown, Guyana. Um, he earned his BA degree at UC Santa Cruz and his PhD at UPenn. Um, he has written a number of books. He's, he is a specialist in uh, African American vernacular English. Um, and he's written on the Creole origins hypothesis. Um, he's written books, Dimensions of a Creole Continuum, American, African American Vernacular English, Features and Use, Evolution and Educational Implications. And then what I think might be his favorite, Spoken Soul, The Story of Black English, which he wrote with his son, Russell Rickford. And in uh, 2000, it won the American Book Award. I first became aware of John in 1996 when the Oakland School Board um, recognized the importance of African American English and began to teach teachers how to use it in the classroom. Uh, and there was a huge uproar in the community. And at the Linguistic Society of America meeting, there was a huge uproar in support. And John Rickford knew way more about it than anybody else. And he was a voice of calm. I didn't know him at that time. I got to know him much more recently um, when he became the president of the Linguistic Society of America, which he was in 2015. So I'd like to introduce now my friend, John Rickford. Is this on then? Let's see what I did here. Um, I was going to say while I'm waiting that um, um, I just forgot to tell you that, uh, that she was the president last year. Uh, and there's another president here, Barbara Partee. Where's Barbara? You can wave your hand. Yeah, you know, uh, um, I think UMass Amherst has a kind of lock on this, uh, on this organization. Um, well, actually, the president next year is from Stanford, so I guess between us we have a lock uh, on this. So I wanted to thank you, first of all, for the privilege of, uh, of talking to you today. And I want to thank all the people who helped to make it possible, Lisa Green, um, Seth Cable uh, and other people who worked so hard. Thank you so much. Before I begin, I want to get a sense of how many people here are linguists? Can you just raise your hand? Oh, a bunch of people. I see, kind of like required course 101. You've got to come here. <laughs> All right. Uh, and um, how many people, if any, are lawyers? Any lawyers? No lawyers? Oh. We need to get them. Ah, one? One? Yeah. Okay. Some of my best friends are lawyers. I, you know, it's, it's fine. It's, uh, it's perfectly fine. Okay, thanks. Well, I want to start talking to you about a subject that I've only really started to get into a few years ago uh, with this particular trial that I'm talking about. But I'm now kind of passionate about it because um, I think it affects a lot of people. A lot of people's lives hang in the balance, um, depending on whether their testimony um, or the statements are heard or heard accurately or not. Um, but most people are really almost completely unaware of it. Linguists are unaware of it. Lawyers are either unaware of it or don't care. That's the only negative comment I'll make about lawyers uh, for the next hour. Oh. Um, but I think it's vital. And I'm going to talk about it in the course of speakers of African American vernacular English or Ebonics, if you want, or African American language, if you want, that many different names. Um, but it affects all speakers of dialects. So in fact, it raises a larger philosophical question about the line between dialect and language, which linguists usually poo-poo. You know, ah, it's not a big deal. Uh, they leave it for the public to struggle with. But um, the problem being that um, some provisions are made uh, for speakers of different languages in courts. So you speak Japanese, you speak Spanish, and you in an English-speaking court, and they provide you with a translator, but not for dialects. Okay, if they consider it what you're speaking to be a dialect of English, um, then they make no provisions for it. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start with a little uh, um, uh, small anecdote about a court reporter who's actually a very important person in this particular trial, but I'm not going to 
say anything more about that. A uh, person who said that she went out to Palo Alto, my neck of the woods in Stanford, to take a deposition from a Scottish speaker, speaker of Scottish English. And she said, you know, we couldn't understand a word. In fact, there were several people around our lunch table who said, you know, uh, they've been to Scotland, they've heard Scottish speakers, and they couldn't understand a word either. Um, but that didn't stop them from taking the deposition and proceeding with the, uh, with the case. Um, and it seems to me there should come a point when you say, I don't understand what the hell you're saying. Um, let's stop this and get somebody who can help us because the whole point of taking your testimony is to get an idea of what happened. Uh, whether you be a defendant or whether you be a witness or an ear witness, um, but people don't. And fundamentally, of course, you don't get to choose your witnesses, nor do you get to choose your defendants. That would be good, yeah, if you only spoke to people who spoke sta perfect standard English, uh, you know, that would be kind of interesting. Um, but you don't get to choose your witnesses, and therefore you, the court system and the society has to do a better job of making accommodation for people who don't speak um, kind of the standard or mainstream uh, variety of English. So let me tell you a bit. This is called Justice for Jean-Tel. How many of you ever heard of Jean-Tel? Oh, good. Okay. I don't mean looking at the flyer on the way to the top, okay? Uh, how many of you heard about Trayvon? Trayvon Martin, good. That's why I can use first name for him, but not for her. Um, so I'll go on to tell you a bit about it. I'll tell you, uh, give you a quick outline why we're going to focus on Rachel Jantel. Um, and it has to do with the fact that she's such a deep speaker of African-American vernacular English. And uh, apparently she was not understood. Most of her very, very crucial testimony was either not understood or was disregarded. Um, so she was found uh, unintelligible and not credible. And I want to give you some other cases involving other English dialects um, from uh, 1954 to the present. Talk a bit about Chantel's dialect. Um, talk about these issues of intelligibility and credibility. And then look at some of the problems that happen elsewhere in schools and workplaces and doctor's visits and house rentals and so on. Um, give a little summary and talk a bit about what we can do to change the situation. So why focus on Rachel Jantel? Well, as you may know, um, the testimony of Rachel Jantel, who was 18 at the time, um, who spoke a very deep African-American vernacular English, uh, was kind of crucial to this case. Um, where George Zimmerman, who was 28 at the time, was tried for the killing of Trayvon Martin um, in Florida. Now, um, the death of Trayvon Martin and his acquittal uh, in a situation where, you know, but he, he was a person that killed um, Trayvon Martin, helped to spark the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, which, of course, has been tremendously influential um, since then. Um, and uh, the very high-profile nature of the trial and very copious coverage in this discussion in print, media, and so on gives us a lot of information on which Jean Tell is almost unmatched, unprecedented in other cases. So in fact, as you'll see in the end, we actually have like 15 hours of speech from Rachel Jean Tell, not just what she said in court, but what she said in, um, in, in depositions. In fact, um, when we were doing our work in the course of it, we happened to reach out to... Um, to uh, Omar, who was the chief defense attorney, and actually he turned out to be the most cooperative person. He sent us, his office sent us all kinds of materials from depositions that we couldn't get from the prosecution, uh, who were the people who were trying to defend, um, you know, prosecute the case against um, Zimmerman. Uh, Zimmerman, you remember, said, you know, punk asses, they always get away uh, when he first saw uh, Trayvon. Um, entering the complex where his um, father uh, um, uh, lived with his uh, girlfriend at the time. And he called the police to say, you know, there's this character, looks like a thug or whatever. Um, and the police told him to, okay, don't do anything, you know, stay away. And of course he made it his duty then to follow uh, Trayvon Martin. Um, so uh, he has his own history, but we'll, we'll go on and talk about other other aspects of it. And I, I want to say, as we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, of course, obviously, um, all lives matter. Um, and uh, this little cartoon which Judith uh, Dagan shared with me, she's a postdoc at Stanford, um, is, is kind of helpful. And she says the whole notion of Black Lives Matter is an answer to the question, should be construed as an answer to the question, you know, do black lives matter? And it's an assertion 
Yet they do matter in the face of all the evidence that you get from extrajudicial judicial killings and um, excessive uh, arrests and prosecution records that maybe they don't. Um, as against the question, which lives matter? Which is a much broader universe that says, oh, you know, all groups matter. And everybody agrees that all lives matter. But black lives are in crisis. It's like the house here that's burning down. And it needs the water, even though you might continue to pour the water on the houses that are not, um, not affected. So why focus on her, as I said before? Oh, you know, where's our tech person? Um, it's gone? OK. Uh, OK, sorry, I got it here. Well, the first thing is that you know, her dialect is very strikingly vernacular. Um, it has structures that are not mainstream or standard. And people noticed it, and they used that as a way of kind of pillorying her. Um, then she was on the cell phone with Trayvon Martin. I knew about the discussions that she had with him up for about 15 minutes before he died, up until the moment just before he kind of fell to the ground and his uh, headset fell off. Um, she was on the cell phone with him. But she had actually been on the cell phone with him for about five hours that day. They were very close friends. So she'd been talking all day. So in many ways, she was like the closest thing to having Trayvon Martin himself in the courtroom. Okay? He obviously wasn't there. He was dead. Um, but she could tell his story. And so the prosecution considered her the star witness. She was on the stand for about six hours, which was far longer than anybody else. Now, what you don't know is that a lot of that time was spent with the, with the um, defense trying to impeach her, trying to argue that what she was saying in court was different than what she said in an earlier interview. And if I talk about that, I'll go off on a tangent, because <clears throat> there's evidence even there that one of the little transcripts that they had of that, it, it wasn't actually a deposition, it was more like an informal interview, was inaccurate. And this is something we find. Almost every transcript we've looked at of a conversation involving African American speakers is inaccurate. Okay? Uh, it has all kinds of errors of, of understanding in the syntax, uh, you know, in, in the grammar, um, in terms of the words. And so you'll see a few examples as we go on. Um, so some of the points that they were arguing that they were trying to use to have a testimony thrown out were inaccurate. You wouldn't hear it on the TV broadcast because a lot of this came, came up at the bench when they'd have these discussions where the judge would call the prosecution and the defense lawyer and, uh, and they would talk about this. But that's what they were trying. They were trying to have a testimony thrown out because it was, um, it was really crucial. Uh, a key part of the defense argument was that Trayvon Martin kind of lay in wait, okay, that he was kind of hiding. I don't know why he would suddenly have this animus towards this guy who he didn't know, who was almost twice his age, but they portrayed him as this kind of thug who was waiting to jump on Zimmerman. Whereas, in fact, um, Trayvon, from um, the testimony of Richard Jantel, was constantly running, trying to get away from this guy who he considered creepy. The guy never identified himself. I mean, he wasn't a policeman to begin with, but he was a neighborhood watch captain. Um, but he never said, I'm a neighborhood watch captain, and like, what are you doing here? In which case, Trayvon might have been able to give him an answer. He was just trying to get back home um, to his, where his, his brother was, his parents were evacuated at a kind of a, con a conference uh, that day. Um, so this guy is following him, and he thought he was kind of creeping. He was trying to get away, and Rachel said, run. And he ran, and then he got out of breath, and he said, I think I lost him, as you'll hear. And then he looks around again, and there he is. So Zimmerman was constantly following him and shadowing him. So he was really the kind of aggressor in the whole uh, thing. But um, in the end, the jurors found it hard to understand and not credible. And um, uh, Louis Bloom wrote this book in 2014, uh, where she made the point based on a, a juror. There was one Puerto Rican juror, uh, only six jurors, OK? So don't think of, of 12 people. It's just six people. Um, and um, she was the only uh, non-white juror. There were no actual African Americans uh, in there. Um, the juror Maddie was a lot more sympathetic, and she told Louis Bloom that no one mentioned Chantel in the jury deliberations. So they deliberated for 16 hours, and the most important witness was never mentioned, and her testimony played no role whatsoever in their decision. Well, that's a travesty of justice um, right there. And I think a lot of it had to do with her dialect. It had to do with other factors, too. Um, but in a sense, her dialect and in a sense, well, also, as we'll see later, maybe her race, her age, uh, was found guilty before Zimmerman was found um, innocent. 
So let's back off from her for a while and just talk about some other cases that we tracked down. Some are um, further afield, because I want to give you a sense that this is a broader, um, a broader um, set of cases. Uh, some of the points I've made already, that interpreters are generally not provided for other dialects, uh, only for other uh, languages. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to, well, um, okay, okay, I'm not going to skip this. I'm just going to say a little word about it. This is from some old data that we, we have um, showing kind of class differences within African-American community. Um, just look at the slide on the right. So this is the extent to which the copula, this word that joins a subject and a predicate, like you want to say, you know, he tall, uh, she crazy, uh, they in the house. Um, so um, this little form of is or are that joins the subject and the, and the predicate um, is often absent in African-American English, as it is in a number of other languages, like, like Russian, like Bengali, uh, and so on. Um, but the frequency with which this happens varies by social class. So you can see here that upper middle class and lower middle class African American speakers in this particular study in Detroit only did it about 5 or 11 percent at a time. Upper working class and lower working class speakers did it much higher um, frequency. So there's more of a break, structural break, um, uh, a sharp break between the middle and the working classes. And, and those figures are actually not that high. And people we've recorded in East Palo Alto, they'll leave out the, the is or are um, 80 and 90% of the time. And you'll see that that's the level at which Richard Jantel um, does it. So I'm just trying to show you of all that a lot of these vernacular or non-standard features tend to be correlated um, with, um, with class um, and with, with, with economics. And of course, they're correlated with other things like speaking informally versus formally, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, around the world, uh, speakers of vernacular non-standard varieties or non-mainstream varieties um, are often very much misunderstood or unfairly judged. And um, uh, Diana Eads, who, whose work we have on the, there's a little bibliography at the end of the paper. I don't have all the items on it shows that this is true of speakers in Austria, speakers of, of Viennese, uh, Italian speakers. I just wanted to get a sense that this is not just an American or an African-American problem. It's an issue around the world. But today I'll concentrate on English vernaculars because this is closer to the case that, that we have. So let me start with some kind of simple cases involving the lexicon or the vocabulary. So um, there's an Aboriginal witness in Northern Territory of Australia who in testimony talked about a half moon shining. So on the night of this murder, there was a half moon shining. And so the opposing counsel knew that there was actually no half moon, literal half moon on that night, just from the lunar calendar. And so they tried to impugn the testimony. But there was an interpreter on hand uh, in Australia. And he was aware that in Australian English, half just means, especially in this context, means a small part. It doesn't necessarily mean literal half. So very cleverly asked the witness to draw the moon that he saw. And the person drew the moon, and it turned out to be a crescent moon, a quarter moon, okay? um, which then helped to validate um, his testimony, because there was a quarter moon, but not a half moon that night. So she notes that you know, because they had this person on standby for witnesses who didn't speak enough English, he was able to intervene in this case and kind of correct the misunderstanding. There's another nice Australian case where someone referred to Charcoal Jack, who was probably properly his father. But again, it was officially mistranscribed as probably his father, because as, as linguists know, per and per are kind of formed in exactly the same place in the mouth. For non-linguists, you know, B and P are miles away in the alphabet, but for linguists, per and per are formed in exactly the same place. They're both bilabial stops, but one is voiceless and one is voice. Okay, I wouldn't give you too much of that, that stuff that we like. Um, but also, semantically, in Australian English, properly means real, because apparently all the, the, the biological father and his brothers are all called, could all be called something like father. And when you wonder, refer to the one who's actually biologically the father, he is properly the father. So if you think about this mistake, to say probably is to actually lead the person in the complete opposite direction. <laughs> Far from having any uncertainty, it means this is absolutely and completely the biological father, not probably the father. So again, that was something that uh, could, uh, could, had to be corrected. 
This case is more insidious. This one here is from Jamaican Creole, a Jamaican Creole speaker in the UK. In the police interview, the person says, when me hear the bop bop, me drop a ground and then me start run. Okay, nice English. Anybody could understand it. But it was mistranscribed as, when I heard the shot, I dropped the gun and then I ran. Okay, guy, it's nothing gun. There's no gun involved. Uh, he's just a wit an, an eyewitness, a bystander. And Brown, Blake, and Chambers, you know, talk about how this misinterpretation comes about um, uh, in 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 Jamaica, as in in Jamaica, as in uh, as in Guyana, uh, sequences of um, "ow" followed by nasal uh, pronounced with "a," uh, the same um, vowel as in as in gun. Um, and that helps to contribute to the error. But in any case, if they warn somebody to correct it, um, you have a very dangerous impression. And in fact, you may have this person who's just an innocent bystander uh, headed to jail for having a gun and dropping the gun uh, when he heard the shots. Okay? Uh, now listen and to this. Ruben M. Koromar, Nina Saloman, I want you to know one crew parable this morning. No member who say you go for dumb. But remember, who said you your foot? Okay, so then if I asked you to transcribe it or tell me in English what he said, uh, I don't know how many of you would feel confident. And he's being fairly formal, okay? I mean, this is not like fast spoken uh, Sierra Leone Creole, but this is English. It's, it's Creole. Um, it's Sierra Leone Creole English, okay? So what is he actually saying? Um, he's saying, My name is Ruben M. Koroma. I am a Sierra Leone man. I want to give you a Creole proverb this morning. Don't think about where you fell down, but think about where you broke or stubbed your foot. Right? No member who said you could fall down, but member who said you broke your foot. Okay? Now, the reason I give you this sample is that because this variety of speech came up in a case in 2003 in New York City, uh, People versus John Smith. John Smith was American. Uh, I have no idea about his ethnicity, but um, he had some kind of argument with Sam Bola, who was a Sierra Leone Creole speaker, and he slashed him with a box cutter. And so um, the court, in this case, accepted an interpreter for the Creole speaker. Okay, now this is always up to the di discretion of the judge in the case, so judges can make their own exceptions. And the lawyer for Smith said that this testimony should be thrown out because Creole, quote unquote, is not some kind of language that one goes to a university and studies. So apparently this is the new standard for deciding uh, mm -hmm. when you should have, a, um, you should have a, um, a, a translator or not. It's nothing more than a patois, an English with a bad accent. But the judge, at least luckily for, the, for, um, for, for Sambola, denied the notion, citing historical and sociolinguistic evidence, that Creole, although related to English, is a separate and distinct language, that cannot be readily understood without an interpreter. In fact, so again, this is why I'm getting more interested in this whole question of how philosophically and ideologically you decide what's a language and what's a, what's a dialect. So now I want to talk about some other cases in Af African American English in the US, uh, but I want to just give you some statistics in case you're not aware of them. One is that African Americans, according to a 2009 study, are incarcerated or locked up at nearly six times the rate of whites. Um, now, there's a ton of research in African-American English. For people who are new to this area, you may not know, uh, but African-American English is the most studied dialect of, of American English and has been um, for a number of years. There's a whole lot of historical and linguistic reasons why that's true. Um, and some of the experts of the subject are in here, like Lisa Green, who has a very famous and well-known book on African-American English. Um, Lisa, wave your hand at least, or Tom, point her out so that uh, they will know who she is. And she's, um, but you know, there are other more recent statistics that are even worse than this. So the statistics at the bottom of that slide, um, so in 2014, 516,900 black males um, versus 453,500 white males, 308,000 Hispanic males are in custody. So black men are in state or physical. Federal prisons, depending on which state you're looking at, 3.8 to 10.5 times more often than white men. So they're not only proportionally represented, but far disproportionately represented. Um, and I'll pass over this slide, but in general, from other studies, 
we find that um, African Americans who are, in, who are in prison can also be very high users um, of African American um, uh, vernacular English. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Well, let me go to some of the cases. So one of the first cases we see where we find the vernacular being used is in the trial of Emmett Till. How many of you know about Emmett Till? Okay, so I'm not going to pass along a, um, a little quiz, but um, uh, Emmett Till um, was a 14-year-old here who was murdered in Mississippi by J.W., um, um, I guess I call him Millen, and Roy Bryant, after going to the store to buy uh, sodas and bubble gum. In a lot of ways, eerily similar to uh, Trayvon Martin. And in fact, in many ways, his case helped to spark the uh, civil rights movement um, of the 1960s in the same way that um, uh, Trayvon's case has helped to, to spark the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Um, the murderers were found guilty. The jurors, in fact, went up afterwards and shook their hands, congratulate them on the, um, the, uh, the verdict. And then the, the next year, they brazenly published a full account of the, of the murder in Look magazine. So if you can look it up, 124.56. We did this, we did this, we did this. Um, but here's the point where the linguistics comes in. So asked in court to identify the person who took Emmett from his house, Reverend Wright, who was like an uncle or something of, um, of, uh, of um, Emmett Till. Uh, and Emmett Till was staying at his house in the middle of the night. These two guys come and they say, you know, where is this guy? And grab him. And so he pointed a gnarled finger at um, J.W. Um, Millam and announced in a loud, clear voice, there he, okay? There he. Now, in most, many varieties of African American English, uh, you in fact cannot have the copula absent there. Generally, um, you don't find, uh, you, you can say, you know, he's sick, he's walking and so on, but usually in this kind of stressed, accented position at the end of a clause, you can't delete um, is and are. Years ago, Labob had said, same thing with contraction in English. You can't say, there he's, okay? You can say he's sick, or you can, he's tall, and so on. Um, but in some varieties, and Lisa says it in um, her um, Louisiana variety, and, um, and Charity has said in her variety, I think in Virginia, uh, you can. So it may be mistranscribed, who knows, but clearly it's a vernacular variety. The speaker's not speaking in standard um, American English. Of course, almost anything that Reverend Wright said wasn't regarded anyhow, but still it's important. By the way, there's a little footnote to this. Uh, the last item on your handout is a book by Timothy Tyson called The Blood of Emmett Till. And it includes a confession from, from Carolyn Dunham, who is formerly Carolyn Bryant, the wife of Roy Bryant, the woman who uh, it is said that um, Till went into the store and made some you know, suggestive remarks to her, and this is what got her pissed, and she told her husband, and so therefore this 14-year-old um, this had to die. And she says that she gave false testimony um, against Emmett Till, and that he hadn't made physical and verbal threats um, against her. So the, the story broke in the like, New York Times and stuff about three weeks ago, but it's detailed in this book, The Blood of Emmett Till. Okay, now there's some other cases. Um, there's one that's actually based in East Palo Alto, which is right across from Stanford, where I live, um, and involved a, young, a guy called Young Bear Tracks. And uh, Young Bear Tracks was convicted of murdering Chicago Eddie, um, although he gave various reasons for why this had to happen. The guy was about to attack him. The guy put him into dozens. If you don't know what the dozens is, it's too long for me to go into what that's all about. But here's the two crucial parts. The prosecutor said it would have been easier to bring out the facts of the case if witnesses were unable to speak English, in a sense, at all. So we could have used competent interpreters. And the Jews later said the greater part of the testimony had been incomprehensible to them. Okay, so remember that example about the, the Scottish speaker? Uh, so um, over and over again you'll see that when jurors and law officials really don't understand what you're saying, it doesn't stop them from going ahead and, uh, and convicting you. Um, unfortunately, in this case, we don't have recordings. And in fact, you don't even get transcripts beyond a certain length of time, unless the case becomes a big national case like Trayvon Martin, the Zimmerman trial. So you, you just have to depend on these, on these reports. 
Um, but more recently, as I've gotten interested in this, I've said yes. And Lisa may get some of these things. You know, we get called up and they say, you know, there's a, there's a trial, uh, there's a case here, and somebody's saying something we don't understand. Um, recently, the Drug Enforcement Administration had an ad out, in fact, for Ebonics translators, because they would get all these wiretaps and they didn't really know what was going on. <coughs> um, but they don't call you when you have defendants whose lives um, hang in the balance, especially when they involve um, African American English has a whole series of very complex markers that come before the verb. Um, so um, Lisa in particular has written about a lot of, of, a lot of these. So things like, you know, been, uh, stress been, uh, he been gone, um, come, uh, done, finna, uh, several others, very, very important to the system. And very often totally misunderstood by speakers of other dialects. So in this particular transcript we have of a woman uh, in a case, she was a defendant, she's talking in jailhouse conversations. And I think a lot of times prisoners forget that jailhouse conversations are all recorded and used against them. So the person actually says, he come to me, but I'm going to take the TV, right? So there's obviously a, an attitude there, but this person says, uh, what happens? As soon as she went into jail, somebody came into the house and told her partner, oh, I came for the TV, and, uh, you know, like, she ain't coming back. So I want the TV, and he wants this, and that. So they all um, laying claim to everything around the house. In any case, be that as it may, all they have is I'm going to take a TV. So the whole attitudinal component and the antagonism is lost. They don't got it, it's mistranscribed as they got it. And then three is particularly bad. I'm finna be admitted, so I'm about to be admitted. It's transcribed as I'm fit to be admitted. And finna is an immediate future, and it means like if I say I'm finna go, I'm going now, or very soon. You know? If you come back an hour later and you see me, then you know, it's like, what's going on? <laughs> um, so, uh, and there are other cases. We keep getting cases all the time. So let me talk a bit about Richard Jantel's dialect. I think I've said a lot of this already. Um, born and raised in Miami, but her mom is from Haiti, and she's a seamstress. Her dad's a taxi driver, from, speaks Spanish from Dominican Republic. So far from having no language, she in fact has at least three languages. <laughs> she has Spanish, she has Haitian Creole, uh, and she has um, African American English, okay? So she's actually more competent than, than the average American, especially one who's not studying at college and has a language requirement to fulfill, okay? Uh, and then, as I said, she was central to the prosecution, long testimony. Um, but she was really castigated in the media for her ungrammatical and slurred speech, okay? So here are just a handful of, like, zillions of comments. She's a dullard, an idiot, an individual who could barely speak in coherent sentences. This is the blather of an idiot. This lady is a perfect example of uneducated urban ignorance. When she spoke, everyone here mumble, mumble, the I'm a Miami girl, the Cannot even speak English. She speaks Haitian hood rat. Okay, I don't know what that is, but um, if you contrast the views, this is a book that has just come out uh, like two weeks ago. Um, Rest in Power, so a new interpretation of RIP, written by the parents of um, Trayvon. Sabrina Fulton and Tracy Martin. And you get a much more sympathetic view of her um, there. Um, Tracy saying that she'd known my son. In fact, apparently how the relationship started is that people used to pick on her. Um, uh, and um, he kind of started picking up for her and they, they kind of <laughs> became friends. Um, and this is how we get this added information about being on the phone to her for about five hours. Sabrina said she was misunderstood either because she spoke too softly or she used slang. So she used slang to characterize her dialect to language. Um, but she said she was just a shy teenager speaking the way she always did. Um, and several other points she says, you know, she's somebody's daughter. She related to her like a mother. Whereas other people totally objectified her. It's like they objectified Trayvon. They kept talking about the thug in the hoodie. And I walk across Stanford campus and I see all kinds of thugs and hoodies. Um, at least I see a lot of hoodies. Um, and uh, people don't necessarily jump to that conclusion. She does make the crucial point that they turned the testimony into a referendum on Chantel, just like they turned the trial into a referendum on, um, on Trayvon. The person said, you know, only in America can a young black kid get, get murdered. 
and be found guilty at his own trial of his own murder. Um, so let me move on. I told you already, we have a lot of data on her, very interesting, very high quality data. So as we look into her language, and I'm, tr I'm going to try to go easy on the linguistic side of it, even though I, you know, we have a lot of linguists, but we have a lot of people who are not linguists. But we want to know, like, how systematic is she? Okay, because speakers of standard and mainstream English tend to think if you're not speaking mainstream English, you're speaking some kind of garbage that you make up as you go along. You know, absolutely not true. This is a, it's not an Afrocentric point to make this point. Every language and every dialect around the world is systematic. If it weren't, you couldn't acquire it. You know, think of a kid. Oh, God, today they're saying this, you know. Today they're doing poor drop, next day they're not doing poor drop. What's going on, you know? Uh, <laughs> how do they form questions, you know? You can't just make it up. Well, some people tend to think as though, like, you want to learn to speak non-standardly, you know, get a bottle of vodka or something, start drinking it, and by the end of it, you'll have a good non -stand. Not at all. Um, we couldn't understand each other. So it's, so it's true as a kind of theoretical assumption that all languages are systematic, and it's true as an empirical finding. Wherever we go around the world and we study it, we find that languages have a system of regularity. Then the other kind of minor question is, to what extent does her usage compare with what we've known of African-American English? Or generally, um, and in particular, how does it compare with Creoles of the Caribbean? Since she has, she has Creole influences not only from her parents, but you know, actually, um, I drove out to her neighborhood one day uh, um, when I was in Miami, and you see all these Jamaican and Trinidadian restaurants. There's, a, there's, you know, there's a lot of West Indians in Miami, particularly in her area. So looking in terms of the sound system, how does her system compare? So again, linguists are always excited about these deletions of T's and D's and so on, and so on. especially when they come in a, a cluster like after hand and pass, there's an N before the, the D, and there's an S before the T. So very often languages don't like to have two consonants coming together. They're, they're hard to pronounce, um, so they tend to, to drop one. And particularly in English, these are dropped. So you can see here that she, she drops um, the, the final T um, a lot of the time, okay, 88% of the time. But in that sense, she's very similar to, um, to uh, adults in Harlem. Um, and sometimes we get overall percentages that are somewhat lower, but we're just looking at Rachel Jantel as one person. I mean, you do a group study, some people are higher, some people are lower, and it drops the, the percentage. So she's not abnormal, and she looks very much like also speakers in Jamaica in that respect. This one is a little more complicated. I'm not going to get too excited about it, but she doesn't just drop the T when she feels like <laughs> Okay, She follows very well-known principles. There's a set of regular constraints on the way you use language. All the time there are constraints when you use language, but nobody sits you down to tell you, okay? Uh, but you learn them as part of learning the grammar of your community. Um, so one of the things that she shows very strong effective is the effect of what comes after the final T or D. And if it's followed by a consonant, like passed by, she's much more likely to lose that T because then you have three consonants in a row, which languages really don't like. So um, pass by, you're more likely to use the T than if you have passed over or passed in. And then also the difference between P-A-S-T and P-A-S-S-E-D, whether you can spell or not, you know that P-A-S-S-E-D, even though it's pronounced past, has grammatical work to do. That T is the grammatical instantiation of E-D. And speakers often then will hold back the deletion um, of that final T. Okay, so um, there are a couple of different patterns that vary from one place to the next. You can see if you look at this closely, she's probably closest to the aces. Um, she's more like Jamaican. Compare this flat line that we have here for Jamaica that just kind of slopes down. Um, doesn't show profound differences by the phonological environment or even the grammatical environment. And that is not her system. Her system is much more the system of African American English. This, I'm not going to say too much about. African-American English has a well-known tendency to merge or neutralize the distinction between it and e when it comes before nasal. Again, you're not aware of it. People don't go around telling you about it. Parents don't sit you down and say, you know, you're five years old, and I need to tell you about the neutralization of it and e <laughs> before nasals. But many times, African-Americans will say uh, e and e, something like it, 
before nasal. So sometimes people have to say, and somebody says, you know, give, give me a, a pen. You want to say, well, is it a sticking pen or a writing pen? Okay. Um, she has some overlap. Uh, so this is, this is the region uh, for air. This is the region for, for it. There's some overlap, but it's only partial. Right? It's not complete. So in a sense, it's like a, in the Caribbean, generally, we don't do that merger in that particular environment. So it's kind of like a, a, a West Indian and kind of like an African-American system, but not completely um, the same. Now, she has many of the classic features of African-American English, multiple negation, I ain't hear nothing. She has this remote past bin I was tell telling you about. Um, I bin you. I was, I was the last person to talk to Trayvon. Okay. Um, now, do people really know? Suppose you get a sentence like one of the classic sentences in our literature. So somebody's a party and they say, well, is she married? And the other person says, she been married. Okay? <coughs> what does that mean? Anybody? Is she married or not? Yes. yes, she's married and she's been married for a long time. Now, that may or may not make a difference to you, but you should at least know the facts, okay? Uh, and a lot of the studies we've done, we find that African-American English and non-African-American speakers have diametrically opposed things. They believe that Ben means that she was married sometime in the past. Um, but no, she's still married, or as, um, as one linguist put in her dissertation, when a guy asked her in the park, hey, babe, you married? And she says, very, <laughs> very married, <laughs> okay. So she said, okay, 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 and he moves on. Um, so that's what it means kind of in this case too, she's very married. Okay, she has that, she has a spectral B, um, that's where his headset be at. It doesn't just mean is that, but where his headset usually is, it's a habitual marker. She says it instead of there for existential, it was a rumor going around his school, and so on and so forth. Um, now I want you to actually listen to her. Um, before I talk about some of these other features. I've been talking about it, but now you get to hear her. Um, and look at number two on the handout, okay? And so we use zero here to highlight, highlight the absence of plural and possessive S and the absence of copula forms in a speech. Okay? And when you're answering. He said he from me. I asked him where he at. And he told me he at the back of his daddy fiance house. Like in the area where his daddy fiance buy his daddy fiance house. Like I said, oh, you better keep running. He said, no, nah, he lost them. Okay, just stop a second. This, this lady's got to take everything down, so you make sure you're okay. So after he said he lost him, what happened then? And he said he he bought the area that his daddy house is, his daddy fiance house is. And I told him keep on me. And he said, no, he just walk faster. I'm like, oh. And I, I had complacency with the heart, so I understand why. So. What, what happened after that? And then a second later, and I turned on and said, oh, shit. A second later? A couple of seconds later, I turned on and said, oh, shit. Okay, let me interrupt a second. When you say the words, oh, Shit, pardon my language. Who said that? The Trayvon. He said it to you? Yes. Okay. And after he used part of my language, he said, oh shit, what happened then? The nigga behind me. I'm sorry. The, by, the nigga behind me. Okay, he used the N-word again and said, the nigger is behind me. Okay, so this is the prosecutor. Um, you see a lot of evidence, if you look at the case carefully, the prosecutor is is not up to the level of the defense. Um, that's one of the reasons uh, the case was also lost. Um, but you can see all these cases where uh, she, in particular, does not use standard English or mainstream S. And you can kind of distinguish them. So third present tense S, so like in the present tense case, it make him hungry instead of it makes him hungry. She deletes that like 98% of the time. In fact, she only has one S in the whole testimony. Uh, zero possessive. His daddy, fiance, I was saying these lovely sequences where yeah, both the daddy is a possessor and the fiance is a possessor, and both of them um, are marked. Uh, and then plural S, she deletes um, much less frequently. And this is true in every single uh, study that we have looked at, um, not only of African American English, but also of other, other dialects. And in fact, some, some uh, theoreticians have long, uh, well, it turns out in general that. Uh, Plural S is acquired a lot earlier 
when people started acquiring English, as it would have been by West Africans acquiring English in the New World, uh, than things like, um, like third person S. And people conjecture, among other things, is because it, it, it refers to a distinction in the real world as against a grammatical um, uh, case of agreement. You know, because you have a third person singular subject. English has this weird thing of having an S uh, under third person singular. Um, that then requires agreement with a preceding constituent, the, the subject, if it's in the third person, it's neither the speaker uh, nor the hearer. Um, but the pattern that she's exemplifying is very, very regular among um, dialects of English uh, around the world. Um, and by the way, some of the patterns of copula absence are also very, very regular. And often in dialects and languages that don't have the copula, if they're marking the past, they're required. Is that true in Russian, please, Barbara? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I didn't plant her there, and I didn't pay her any money uh, to say yes. Um, so in fact, uh, Jeff Pullum wrote a very nice article. You could look it up. I think it was in Nature back in, about the time of the Ebonics controversy, called Language That Does Not Know Its Name, showing that, in fact, a lot of the key features of African-American language are shared in common with other languages. Um, around the world. So they, again, they don't come out of nowhere. It's not a set of guys or, 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 or women who sit around at night and say, oh, let's kind of let's mash up the English language and we're going to do it this way. No, it follows fairly strong, almost universal principles. Anyhow, as we look at our usage in third person S, see again, it's very high, but it's not off the charts completely. It's very similar to the usage of Tinky Gates um, and uh, another speakers, less so Chapel Hill, but it's a very well-known feature of African American English. Possessive S, uh, also um, very comparable to some speakers we've recorded um, in other places. Her plural S rate is higher than African American English. Actually, African American English actually does not, uses a fairly low rate of deletion of S with plural. But at least she knows to do it less often than with the other kinds of S's. And then when she was on the Piers Morgan show, do any of you remember Piers Morgan? He was a British guy. Uh, he used to be always opposed to gun, guns and so on, strict gun laws. I think they helped to run him out of America uh, pretty fast and packed him back to England. Um, but when he went on the Pierce Morgan show, Pierce Morgan sat down with her and her lawyer. She had a lawyer of her own by the time, I think from the Haitian community. And he said, look, you know, I want you to relax. Everybody thinks you're stupid. They're saying terrible things about you. Just take your time, tell your story. And she came across much more favorably in that context. And she didn't shift her um, possessive and third singular S usage, but her possessive rate dropped right down to the level of other speakers we've looked at in African-American English. It's as though she anticipated our study, and she says, you know, John Rickford is going to be showing this slide, and I want to show that I can behave like the folks from East Palo Alto. Um, so My just listen birthday, to this. This is on the handout, too. Number three. So... Death creeped me out. I don't, don't do death at all. I even told my parents, I'm not going to their funeral. I'm not doing none of that. I don't like funerals. Okay, so you can see at least some of the S's coming in there. She's kind of showing you the statistics I just showed you. Um, not in the other cases, but the third person S. All right, let me kind of move a little um, more quickly. Uh, um, she follows all the classic constraints on African American English. She doesn't delete am. She says am. She contracts am, I'm, but she doesn't delete it. She doesn't delete is and das, was and is. I mean, that's the beauty about language. Uh, once you kind of have the basic rules of a language, you can take even a fairly short sample, and you find it even in literature. If you go to Fences, how many of you have been to Fences, the movie? Fences, Denzel Washington. Okay, yeah, you got to go see it. It's a play, of course, originally by August Wilson, who is a fantastic exemplar of the vernacular. Um, but you can take two or three pages of, of Fences, the script, and you can see a lot of these patterns. You'll see he says, I'm, but then he says, you know, he bad or he tall, and so on and so forth. So he follows all these rules. There's variation in a bunch of phonological and other features, but a lot of these features are fairly strikingly similar from one place to the next. Um, 
I'm going to go a little more quickly because I don't want to lose you with the things that get us excited. Me, we wake up in the middle of the night and we're all charged up about this, but, but you may not all be charged up. She, she has, actually, her rates of copulapsins are lower than for Foxy and Tinky. They're not statistically lower, but they're, they're very comparable to other speakers. Um, and um, if you look at the, again, speakers never behave arbitrarily when they're speaking a language or a dialect, okay? And there are not only these qualitative constraints that say, don't do it with am, don't do it with was, but do it with is or are, but there are quantitative constraints so that speakers of African-American English know again without anybody telling them that they can delete it more often before gonna. They can say he gonna go, uh, he tall, but he a man, much less frequent before a noun phrase. Okay. And she shows all of that, and if you do various kinds of quantitative analysis, you see that that comes out true. So the point I'm making so far, and I really want to repeat, is that Rachel Jantel is not behaving irregularly. She's not behaving randomly. She's not behaving haphazardly. This is not the blather of an idiot. This is, in fact, an example of somebody who knows the dialect of her community perfectly and is behaving just like speakers in East Palo Alto 5,000 miles ago in accordance with a system that's been inherited. Let me say a bit about their lexicon, um, just the vocabulary. Um, there's some occasional examples of possible inference from Haitian. Um, let me just get to one of them. Well, there's this use of for, meaning in order to. I wanted to talk to my mother for I could agree with, for she could agree for me to talk to her. That's not an African American vernacular English feature. It turns out it seems to parallel usage in French, Haitian Creole. Um, very strongly. Then there's this one, which is also in your handout. Um, come on. Uh, are you employed? No, I live under my mother. What do you mean by that? She's supporting my habit. <laughs> uh, well, uh, um, when you say she supports your habit, she you... give me what I want. Can you be a little more specific? She support me. I see. Okay, she pays for you to everything. do what you everything. Right. So now um, to tell you, this is this is from the deposition. This is not in the court. Uh, she was fairly friendly with Don West, but after like seven hours of this, she'd had it with him. Um, so by the time, in fact, see a lot of things. She came into court. She had a lot of attitude. If you looked at if you look at any of these things, she has a lot of attitude. Even when she was polite, like the second day she came to court, the first day she was kind of really full of attitude. And they said, you got to come back tomorrow. And she said, I ain't going back tomorrow, son. And they said, you know, you can't talk like that in court. So next week she comes back and everything they say, she says, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. In fact, they said, did somebody talk to you? She said, no, nobody talked to you. I think somebody talked to you. But anyway, be that as it may. But don't take that yes, sir, to be politeness, okay? Because <laughs> a lot of time, yes, sir, right? <laughs> it's like shoot clenched teeth. Um, but anyhow, in terms of this particular case, um, uh, um, uh, Michelle said, well, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a larger thing that you find also, live under my mother's roof, but it meant also support completely. Like, you know, people will tell you, you'll hear that sometimes, those of you who were teenagers once, as long as you are under my roof, <laughs> you're going to follow the rules, right, what it might be. But these are the two words that really set things going. Uh, Trayvon says, a nigga's still following me. And this is what... A, as she explained, um, in fact, on the Pierce Morgan show, this means male, and it's used for all kinds of, of males. And she even said, it could be Chinese male, uh, could be no matter. And he, he knew that Trayvon was not African-American, right? But he said, the nigga's still following me, okay? Um, and then she used this other phrase uh, where a guy says, a creepy ass cracker. And I could go on and on and talk about this, um, but it's a very regular structure in African-American English to have an adjective followed by ass, followed by the noun. And in fact, Arthur Spears had written a very important article about this years before. And if you look on, um, on six on the handout, you'll see a whole bunch of other examples that, um, that were recorded in a particular video. But here's what's interesting. By the way, people focus a lot on ass and cracker. They didn't focus on creepy. It was actually one of the key things because he was scared of this guy. He didn't know what this guy was up to. And this grown man was following him um, everywhere he went. Um, he knew he was up to no good. He just went to buy you know, soda and, some, and some, um, some, some candy. But the white Jews were offended, apparently, by creepy-ass cracker and were done with Jantel once they heard that. 
and they also use the word nigger, and the, the, the defense very cleverly, uh, insidiously, turned this against them. They said, they're the racists, okay? You're saying uh, race was a part of this trial. By the way, the, 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 the prosecution decided not to make race a part of the case, which was clearly a mistake. Um, but um, they said, well, she said, well, they, uh, she, at some point she called um, Zimmerman a racist, which really, you know, not too hard to, to disprove. And he said, well, it was a racist. Uh, race came into this trial because you put it into the trial, you and Trayvon, okay, using words like nigger. Everybody knows that's a bad word. Uh, creepy ass cracker, you know. And you'll see later on that, in fact, one of the jurors makes a similar um, kind of point. And these two young grad students, uh, Tiana Sloeb and Grace Sullivan, um, have written some very interesting papers uh, on this part of the trial. So overall, I've said some of this already. Um, systematic, uh, and um, her system is primarily African-American English. So now let's talk a bit about intelligibility and credibility. And I want you to just look at um, seven on the handout which has a transcript of um, this, these comments by Jewel B37. So. Did you find it hard at times to understand what she was saying? A lot of the times. Because a lot of the times she was using phrases I had never heard before and what they meant. When she used the phrase, uh, creepy ass cracker, mm -hmm. what did you think of that? I thought it was probably the truth. I did, think Trayvon probably said that. And did you see that as a, a negative statement or a, a racial statement, as, as the defense suggested? I don't think it's really racial. I think it's just everyday life, the type of life that they, they live and how they're living in the environment that they're living in. So you didn't find her credible as a witness? No. OK, so um, in general, she didn't find her credible. But she totally believed that Trayvon did say creepy ass, cracker, and nigger, and that's the way they live. So it's kind of a distancing, you know, they, um, and she said that, um, that she found Zimmerman um, very, very credible. Um, there, there are a lot of other issues here, but um, um, one of the points I wanted to make in this whole section is that there, were evident, there was evidence that at a number of points, Jews really did have trouble understanding her. Um, and sometimes they would interrupt to ask questions and the judge would say, no, you know, you can't, you can't, it's not, you know, like you're not a lawyer. You can't say, you know, what did you say and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah. And so she kind of admonished them not to ask questions. Um, and I think that might have uh, affected some of what went on. Um, but uh, as I mentioned before, there were no African-American English speakers on the jury. So there was no one at any point who could say, come back in the courtroom, oh, this is what she meant, or, or so on. Not to say that every African-American uh, speaker would um, have understood, but I think a lot of people um, would have. Uh, and from some of the recent work that um, some other linguists have done, uh, Taylor Jones and um, Jesse Kapfeld, uh, they've done some nice, interesting study, studies looking at how African-Americans and non-African-Americans understand sentences are actually used in courtroom testimony, and they find almost 100% understanding by um, white jurors, and they heard some really egregious misunderstandings. Um, so there were a lot of nuances, I think, that people didn't, uh, didn't get. And so you can argue that, well, look, some of her linguistic features might have made it harder for them to, to understand Richard Chantel. Um, and it turns out that we've done almost nothing to study the receptive competence of blacks of whites and whites of blacks and other cross dialect um, issues. We poured all our attention into product production, you know, how speakers differ and what they use. Um, but we have some evidence from other studies of, of African American English. We have some studies I did years ago, again, looking at things like she'd been married. Um, most blacks um, got it right. Um, whites, only about 8 out of the 25 uh, got it right. Um, Jones and Kalbfeld, as I said, have been. Uh, doing a lot of recent studies um, and find that there's a vast difference. Uh, you see African-American speakers were 100% accurate. Non-African-American English speakers were only about 45% accurate. Okay? Um, and if you, look at, if you go back to the, the same controversy that, uh, that was mentioned earlier with Ebonics, 
You get all these examples of cartoonists and reporters using B incorrectly. So they would say, you know, she'd be sitting in the chair right now, which is, you, you know, you can't do that. Right? Unless you somehow, you could, well, certainly you can't use it right now, but you could say she'd be sitting here and she'd be sitting here, I mean, she'd be sitting here every day. Okay, and, and there it is, she's here today, that's part of the evidence. She's always there, okay? Um, so um, I'm gonna move on. These are examples you can use in class. You ask them about kitchen, you know, what does kitchen mean? African-American speakers understand it, non-African-American speakers don't. Um, so there are a number of issues that seem to need to be done. But I think the crucial point I wanna make before I lose your attention, I know I've been going on for a while, uh, is that we also have a lot of evidence that it is not just the language or the dialect itself that affects credibility and understanding, but other factors, attitudes towards the speakers themselves, okay? So, um, in general, this is an old study, but there are many more recent studies. African-American English was understood less and judged less favorably um, than New Yorkese or Standard English. Um, there's some other studies that I don't have up here yet. Um, well, let me t talk about these and then come to, let me say it while I can remember. There's some nice studies looking at courtroom, how jurors and other people understand people who are testifying. And race is a factor, so you can control for all these factors. Um, African-American speakers in general, uh, people are more um, hostile. And speakers of African-American English are considered um, uh, also less credible, okay? Um, there's some interesting, interesting studies this one is an interesting study for those of you in college, because this is a study that looked at back at nothing to do with African American English, has to do with Asian tears. So a lot of college kids, oh, you know, they get these very bright kids from from uh, China or Japan or whatever. Uh, they're studying in departments and their service tears, and kids say we can't understand them, right? So they did some studies where they would play back exactly the same audio. They show a white TA and they show an Asian TA, Asian TA can't understand, um, trouble, you know, and so on and so forth. Show a white tape, exactly the same soundtrack. I got it, I, I can understand it. And it goes back to some studies that were done by the 1950s on African-American kids. Same thing, exactly the same soundtrack. Uh, African-American kids were heard as being less competent and less um, eager uh, than, than white kids. Uh, Levery and Kiesel is an interesting recent study, a little controversial. Because what they would do is they would give people um, statements that they said uh, people weren't sure of. So they might say something like, do ants sleep at night? I don't know. Do ants sleep at night? I don't know. How many people think ants sleep at night? How many, okay, nobody. How many people think ants don't sleep at night? Okay, everybody's kind of tentative. I don't even know the right answer. But <laughs> it turns out if the statement is made by somebody with a heavy accent, heavy foreign accent, people don't believe it. If it's made by his body with an American accent, not regular American accent, they say, yeah, it's probably true. So there's, there's a long complicated thing. They argue that there's additional processing difficulty and this affects the credibility. Some other linguists like Megan Sumner says, ah, it has nothing to do with processing difficulty because if you take a British speaker uh, with a heavy accent, they believe it because British dialects are cool. Um, <laughs> so, so there's a kind of reading, people who read dialect to make inferences about the speaker. That are often wrong, of course. Uh, but it really shows up in the case of African-American English uh, speakers. Um, I am, uh, I mean, I'll say a little bit about, there's a whole cluster of attitudes that come out. This is a talk by a young assistant professor I just heard. She wrote a book, um, Cook County. It's actually about Cook County. Anybody from Chicago? Any Chicagoans? No Chicagoans? Okay, so you know where Cook County is. I don't, but apparently that's one of the biggest juvenile courts and they just process people through like, like, you know, like cattle, so to speak. And what was interesting about this book is written by a, a woman in law. She has nothing to do with African-American English, but in her talk and in her book, she talks a lot about how the, the, the cases and discussions are racialized and racialized through language, okay? So they call all these kids mopes, like, and they have other terms, I don't want to read them, but you can read them yourself, as the derogatory attitude was towards them. But then they use the language to kind of mock them. See, so see this guy, he's like, oh man, that ain't right, that shit ain't right. Why the judge be like that? This is the, the white, uh, actually probation officer in this case, I think, uh, talking about it. Um, and similarly, if a person 
says that they know eyewitness and so who could help them, but they have names like Pookie, or even, even the preacher, okay, if they consider them non-standard names, they don't, they don't follow them, they don't follow them up, okay. Um, so language becomes part of the mechanism for interpreting the validity, actually the worth of the person as a human being, as to whether you pay attention to them or not. Um, so some of that, I think, very much in this case, applies to Vichel Jantel. Um, so I, I'm going to move on. Mopes is kind of... So I have a little section here, but I'm going to skip it, um, because you can ask where these attitudes come from. And in fact, as um, Rosina Lippi has shown, a lot of them come from Disney cartoons. Now, not just from Disney cartoons, but Disney cartoons reflect it. So the, the, the crows in, in Dumbo, um, the crows in Dumbo in 1956 uh, showed structures that linguists didn't talk about until much later. Like he be done, I be done, uh, what's the sentence? It goes, uh, I be done seeing blah, 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 before I see an elephant cry, uh, fly. So there you have this kind of almost future perfect that, in fact, people didn't talk about until Lisa and John Barr and others came along that Disney was exemplifying. But, you know, if you look at the Lion King, you look at a lot of these other things, the bad guys are speaking deep vernacular, um, and the good guys are not. Okay, so, okay I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip it. Yeah, I'm going to skip this. Um, I, actually, I think I'm going to skip a lot of this, too, because I, it's, it's almost time for me to stop. So I'm going to skip. Uh, all right, I'll give this very quickly. So going beyond the courtroom, um, we see lots of cases where uh, African-American English or the vernacular um, is relevant and often works against uh, kids getting a fair outcome. So to kind of anecdotally, Vivian Paley in her very well-known book, White Teacher, says there was this kid from Louisiana, okay, uh, Lisa, and she said her voice was soft and her speech so slurred I could not understand a word, okay? Um, and by the way, there's another study I didn't mention, a famous study by Tucker and Lambert, where he asked black and white southerners to evaluate various kinds of speech. And it turns out that they all kind of agreed that network speech was the best, but the second best for the black southerners was um, recordings of black speech. Uh, and the second best for the white southerners was recordings of white speech. And, and almost contrary-wise, that second best was worse for the black speakers, and the other people's second best was worse for the white speakers. So you can see that there's an effect of who is listening to it, okay? Just in the same way Trayvon's mom and dad could look at Rachel and see a human being. They could see somebody who looked like, they weren't put, I mean, she was, she was overweight. She had a lot of things. Um, um, you, you've seen Precious, okay? Um, the movie, a lot of people, in fact, compared Rachel Chantel to the leading person in, in, in Precious. They didn't see that. They saw it as, they saw it as somebody's daughter. Um, and this is relevant, as we see later, because a lot of, ju a lot of lawyers use um, peremptory um, calls to get rid of, of black jurors on, on juries. Um, so they often not represented. Um, but the point I wanted to get is that Labob and others have shown that, in fact, taking the language of African-American kids into account I'm going to skip these. This shows you how bad the teaching of reading is in, 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 in Rachel's schools. It's abysmal. That is rich. And almost any other kid from the schools would have done as badly as she did in reading. Um, the, the, the defense lawyer knew from his previous work that she had a hard time reading. And so he would constantly give her sections of transcript or letters she'd written and said, why don't you read this for us? And then she would say, you know, I, I, I don't read cursive. Uh, and so on and so forth. Anyway, I'm going to skip all of that. But what I wanted to show you is this work in linguistics showing that if you, in fact, build on the vernacular and use that to teach standard, to teach reading, you can, in fact, get rid of some of these um, minority differentials in reading success. Uh, so this is from the work of Labov, um, post-test after the use of linguistically informed methods. And some work done by Julie Sweetler, one of my students, showing that the kind of gain that students make was highest when you took their vernacular into account rather than ignoring it or disparaging it. Um, being heard, John Barr and others have shown that 
You call up to rent an apartment and you speak in African American English. Landlords use it, of course, to read your ethnicity and then practice uh, discrimination. Um, you can see some other work by Fisher and Massey that shows the same thing. The extent to which you get a response when you call about an apartment uh, varies depending on whether you speak white English or black accent or full-fledged grammatical black English. Um, some more recent work by Tamasi shows that there's a lot of misinterpretation that goes on when people go to doctor's offices um, if they're speaking uh, deep vernacular. Um, okay, so let me give you my quick summary. Um, what I tried to say in this talk is that, uh, as we zoom in on this particular case, is that there was kind of an injustice done to Rachel John Tellin in sense to her good friend, uh, Trayvon Martin, uh, because her African-American English, although it's systematic and rich in complexity, like almost any other variety, was misheard and her evidence was disregarded through unfamiliarity and prejudice. And I try to argue that this is also true in other domains, like schools, housing searches, and so on, and that it's also true in other regions around the world. And so, you know, what can we do to fight this? So for the linguists, I think we should take language uh, as, as more central and take our training as providing a vehicle for us to intervene to try and make a positive difference because the issues that are affected are everywhere uh, in society. Um, I think we need more research on intelligibility. We know almost nothing about it. Um, those of us who've been asked to work on cases and projects involving African-American English speakers in courts, you know, should say yes. I said no for many years. I mean, I got a, I'm busy enough. I got a ton of other stuff. I don't exactly enjoy um, dealing with issues like robbery and murder and, and so on. Um, but I finally come to realize that people's lives are hanging in the balance and that I should at least um, say yes in terms of checking transcriptions and so on. And I think we should continue to push for vernacular speakers to be heard uh, in the courts and in other places. But we should also, and this is a little more controversial because linguists tend not to believe this, that we should help people to learn standard English if they want to. Um, uh, and there's a chance, uh, a fact that I might actually get to meet Richard Jantel in her village. She has a kind of whole village of people who support and work with her. A lot of them are, are Haitian in Miami uh, in April. And part of the reason is that some of you may know she was offered some schooling. Uh, Joyner said he would, uh, what's Joyner's first name? I've got Tom. Had offered to pay for her college, but she's not college ready. And, um, and uh, so she needs some help both with literacy and, you know, use of English. And, and I've said, if you want to learn standard English, I mean, we know her system very well. We've studied 15 hours of her speech. And instead of trying to pick up a whole big book on English, standard English, we can point to the number of features that she needs to work on. But we should push for interpreters as an option. Not easy to talk about, okay, because, you know, the average person might find it patronizing, you know. Um, you know, Lisa goes to testify and we say, okay, you know, she speaks English, but she also speaks African-American English. Okay, well, you know, why does she need an interpreter? And she's not going to need an interpreter for every single word, but some of the crucial structures, um, if she can't switch, will need some interpretation. Fight to end these peremptory strikes against African-American jurors. Supreme Court was the rule on it last year, but then after Scalia died and the court went to eight people, I don't know what happened, but I don't think it actually came up. And I think at least get native speakers and linguists um, to be able to check the transcripts that are made every day. Usually by, in fact, so the police will like ask their little secretary, ask their secretary, I don't mean say little secretary, but I mean somebody has no expertise in this area. You know, listen to this and transcribe it, you know. Okay, I'll transcribe it, but it's, it's full of errors, okay? Um, that doesn't make sense. Fight for jurors to get transcripts. I did not know that the jurors don't ever get the transcripts. Transcripts are really there apparently for appeal, right? If the case is lost, uh, if, if there's an acquittal, the, the prosecution cannot appeal, but the defense can appeal if the person is found guilty, and then they can make reference to the transcript. Now, the transcript themselves are full of errors, but at least there's something. Um, but in the case of Richard Jantel, they actually never even saw the, the transcripts. 
And then I think we need to get out and, uh, and do more making a difference to the world. And then, as I say here finally, you know, stay woke. Uh, this is my students like y'all helping to, to hit the rest of us. Um, so um, the reason I think it's relevant here, these, these students, Yale students, Boykin and CRISPR this year, were the ones who did the research that revealed this very harsh statistic from 2010 to 2012, fully skilled black men ages 15 to 19 at a rate 21 times the statistic for white men of the same age. So I think there's a lot of other data um, that are out there that we haven't looked at. So we need to stay woke, stay woke uh, fight dialect prejudice, because I think the, the impact extends to thousands, if not millions of people. These are the people who helped me a lot with this paper. Cherise King, my grad student, uh, we went on, she became my co-author, and we published a paper with a lot of this data and other information I haven't had a chance to say in language, the Journal of Linguistic Society of America. Um, and then Cara Ranti, Jonathan Kim, Aurora Martinez, Marty Carlyle, Labibo Lapide, and Helica Previt, and Maisha Anderson. So um, I thank them, uh, thank them all. So thank you, and if you have stamina, I'd be happy to take some questions. Please. Do you want to call on your own question? Sure. Yeah. Come on. Extra credit for students who ask questions. <laughs> yes. Um, so I don't necessarily want to be the one asking this, uh, but, uh, No, it doesn't have to be linguistics at all. Um, okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. No, just ask a question. Okay. Um, it's about Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Is the past tense only deleted in the yeah, I can't remember the example I gave her. No, it's very widely, it's very widely um, deleted. And the difference also is that very often in the Caribbean, and I'll try, I'll get back to the other more general issues, but in the Caribbean, past tense is grammatical, but it's not really grammatically unmarked. As Pickerton showed years ago, it depends whether the verb is stative or non-stative. So almost all non-stative verbs, action verbs like walk, tell, and so on, when you use the verb stem, it means past, okay, or anterior. Um, for stative verbs like know and have, they describe a state, the verb stem by itself means present or non-past, and you use, you use been to make it past. Not stress been, say been know, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's very widespread. It's not a phonological constraint. African American English in general, the studies that have been done with, with irregular verbs like uh, tell, told, um, you find very low rates of non marking. And so the main zero pass are cases that you can argue are phonological, like walk, walked. Okay, thanks. Yes? I would have to check with my experts, but the judge does have the final um, say. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Come on. Extra credit. Extra credit. Yes. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I like to turn things in a positive way. Okay. Had to do what? Barn duty. I know. And you, have, you know, you have to learn life saving. Then you have to learn how, life saving to graduate.
So then that goes into what does that mean? Like to even say African American black or like there are different dialects even within that, right? Like if you True. go to Chicago, it's very different from New Orleans, right? Yeah. But I think in some ways. what that does to but how that how black people internalize that, that this isn't official because this isn't what I need to succeed, my identity is irrelevant to success in society. Yeah. It's not just the same as writing history. We don't teach African history, like we have European history of the AP but we don't have any AP classes for Latin American or like African history. Black and brown identities, histories, narratives don't matter in our education system, period. Well, so let me just say a couple things. Uh, when I was in high school going up in, in Guyana, we, we sat these exams. Um, we had become, just become independent, but um, they introduced West Indian history at the lower level when I was in high school, but not at the advanced level. So those of you know the British system, the GC, A-level exams. Um, so when I did history for advanced level, I studied British, European, and American history. There's no West Indian history. And in fact, some people say, you have no history. <laughs> it's partly true because not many people had written books about it. But I do want to say a couple of things. Um, you make a very strong argument for everybody, but there was a, oh, what's the name of the woman? I can't remember her name. In Rethinking Schools, I don't know if you remember looking at that. Uh, so Lisa Green and I, actually, she was out at Stanford one year, and we taught a course in African-American English together. Um, and uh, um, this woman teaches in a teacher's training college, and she regularly teaches them African-American English. And so one of the teachers said, why do we need to learn African-American English? Because they're all working in urban environments. And she says, you don't need to know African-American English to be a teacher. But you need to know it if you want to be a good teacher. Um, and it comes up again and again in, 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 the, in the course of, uh, of teaching. So um, uh, I, I like your radical proposal, but I would say that at least in more restricted domains, like education, I think the courts need to be sensitive to it. Um, because, you know, now, as I said, for my money, they would stop locking up black people at the rates they do. And if they picked more standard English speakers and they, they said standard English was a requirement to be locked up, you know, that'd be cool. I don't say it's cool. <laughs> but, but as long as the current system continues, you have to be able to understand and deal with, with this. And, and, it's, and as I said, it's more than just African American English. It's all these other dialects. You cannot lock up a Scottish English speaker either. Um, uh, you know, of course, there are other reasons why it's maybe less likely, but still, you've got to be able to understand. As some people have said, law is about language. <laughs> okay, so many aspects of law depend on language, and uh, if you don't understand what people are saying, you really can't come up with a, a, a correct conclusion in each case. Any other questions? Yes. in Good. the 1990s, okay. in the loop, mm -hmm. and we had a lot of black students, and they, it blew their minds when I told them that they spoke, what they spoke at home was a dialect, and it had regularities. Most of them said, no, we speak a slang. Yes, no, just no, like... No, we shouldn't, it's a slang. No, no, it's not a slang. It's, and they all came out of that class all the time with that kind of mind-blowing experience. So I'm hoping that we got something, a step in between, and we are too far ahead of the game, and maybe because we are here at UMass, you know, in the Pioneer Valley. But there may be teaching linguistics or introduction to language at the lower levels so that everybody understands that uh, it's not your fault because most of the time it's like I wouldn't have thought I served in Jibiji. It has never occurred to me to say, well, no, if this person uh, it speaks African American vernacular, I am not going to understand it. Now, I probably could in my area, you know, because one understands more. But say, if I move to South Carolina, and I've done research there, and I don't understand the teenagers. I was trying to get information. I can't understand it. So, but it would never occur to me 
to say, I cannot understand that, so excuse me from the jury. Nobody ever does that. Yeah. Or ask for some help. Um, well, there's a lot of aspects to your question. I'm not going to answer all of them. A lot of it goes back to her point, um, which is that we are socialized into thinking that some things are valuable or important and other things aren't. And I started early on, I talked about you know, August Wilson. And so then August Wilson, who was a very interesting, I mean, August Wilson, if you've never looked at August Wilson, you've got to look at August Wilson. Because um, uh, he was always challenging conventions. And um, uh, anyhow, when he started writing, he said he wanted to be a dramatist. So he thought he not only had to use standard English, he had to use a high, highfalutin kind of standard English. So he said, uh, I had a chance to interview him years ago before his death. And he said he wrote things like, terror comes over the night, flies over the night like a hawk. You know? <laughs> he thought this was great. But nobody else thought it was great. And his characters were all dead and so on and so on. And he said, you know, what's going wrong? He said he, said, he, said he started listening. Uh, he grew up in the Hill District of Pittsburgh, and he started listening to African-American characters arguing with each other. He gave a nice example of two characters arguing about whether the railroad tracks came through this part of town or that part of town. The kind of stuff, you know, it's a great love of language. People don't really care what the hell they're arguing about, but they, they love the argument. <laughs> and they're, they're being very eloquent and powerful, and he said, wow, this is powerful. How many of you have seen an August Wilson play? Okay, how many of you have seen Ma Rainey's Black Bottom? Okay, so I went to see Marvini's Black Bottom the other day, and it's exactly this line. He has the same excerpt of the people arguing about the train. So he said, once I started listening to people, I realized, and his words were, that art is within the words and the life of the people. And he came to appreciate that, and he put it in the, 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 the words of his characters. He said, and